One more time. One more time. Now you think that the privatization of space exploration could be a good thing in the long term or oh, even absolutely. in the short term? Oh yeah, Pri privatization of space is great. Everybody. <clears throat> We all love our phones that tell us which side of the street we're on and where the nearest coffee shop is in your hand. That information comes from outer space. We all rely on weather reports that comes from outer space. All that takes place with, because we have assets or satellites in space with extraordinary instruments on them. So people make money in space. People have made money in space for decades and that business, all those businesses are growing because it's faster than driving around making maps and writing stuff down. With that said, everybody wants to fly in space, uh, which I think is what you're talking about, and that's going to be great. You know, it's starting out at $200,000, Canadian or U.S., and everybody hopes that in the coming decades it will come down to some, you know, this will be your 40th birthday gift, a, a ride in space. So that's all good. <clears throat> but. Along with that, starting with this, you're starting out with the, Mar the Mars orbiting mission, MOM, uh, India's uh, big success, just went into orbit around Mars. Uh, that stuff, those explorations are where the extraordinary discoveries are going to be made. This is where we may find evidence of life on another world, which would change this one, let me tell you. One more time. time. Now, when you were growing up, what was that moment where you're like, this is what I want to do? Was it like watching something on television? Was it science fiction, a book? Well, uh, I had a profound experience with bees, bumblebees. I watched a lot of bumblebees, and I read in Ripley's Believe It or Not that bumblebees cannot fly. And everybody's, wait a minute, bumblebees fly fine. Ripley's has got a problem, not the bees. And that was a big deal to me. And then um, I flew toy airplanes, model airplanes, and then uh, uh, my parents, my mom especially, gave me my grandfather's glassware. Now he was an organic chemist. And in those days, chemists blew their own glass. It was a skill, like you can probably write some sort of computer program. You can probably write some rudimentary JavaScript or some crazy, I don't know, with the kids. But those were the skills that those guys had. And so I just was absolutely fascinated with that stuff. And so I've loved science, really, I'm not kidding, since before I can really remember. It feels like we're in a very exciting time. And you've got this generation of kids that are growing up in an era where all these things are happening involving Mars. How do you take that raw curiosity and sort of combat the cynicism that arises in the world today with a kid to nurture them so they can grow up and do those things. <clears throat> well, this is my mission in life. When it's you're in love, kids. right? Oh, cool. When you're in love, you want to tell the world. So, uh, if you can, show your kids Saturn through a telescope. Show the Moon through a pair of binoculars. They'll be, they'll be changed forever in a good way. And everybody has asked these two questions: Where did we come from? And are we alone? And if you meet somebody that says, oh, I don't never, no, they're lying. Of course they've wondered that. Are there aliens on other worlds that fly by here and wonder what we're doing? Do they send us radio signals? Are they watching uh, TV Ontario, you know, on, on some 30 light year away star system? So these are all great questions that are deep within us. And where did we come from? Where, how did we all get here? What are we doing here? If I may, what's up with that? And these questions are, um, are, are answered only or largely through space exploration. One more time. time, time, time. Rosetta mission, uh, this was like 20 years in the making. It That's took right. 10 years of engineering and mathematics and all this stuff to go through. What are we going to find when we get to Rosetta? Like, what are they looking for? Oh, we'll learn more about our origin, where we all came from. That's what we're looking for. How do asteroids form? What is their composition? What is their relationship to the exploding supernovae that made all the elements that we know of, that we know in chemistry, that we're made of? How did we all get here? Understanding the orbital mechanics. How did this object, it's such crazy strange shape, end up in the orbit that it ended up in, and what's it made of? Does it have, for example, amino acids? 
which uh, are what you and I are made of. And apparently they occur naturally. And there's now a very compelling theory that life is actually the most stable uh, outcome. Thermodynamics uh, makes life the most efficient molecule that can form. And this is like out of carbon. This is like, <laughs> really? This is according to thermodynamics? Uh, to a, a very reasonable modern theory in physics. And it was orbiting through space for like 10 years, yeah, tracking yeah. down this asteroid. It's rocket science, man, to get these <laughs> orbits to line up, to get science. these orbits to line up. And you understand this thing went in orbit around an asteroid. I mean, it's like going in orbit around a piece of dust. There's just not that much gravity to work with. But if you come in at just the right angle, just the right speed, it's cool. One more time. time.